Greetings, YouTube. Um, the other day, while reading the A Field Guide to Doomsday blog, um, I came upon a questionnaire. And perhaps, per apparently, this was actually done by someone else, and this person is kind of borrowing that idea, and I'm going to borrow it again. So, you know, who knows where it started. Um, and it's a list of questions, 22 quick questions for your post-apocalyptic campaign setting. Um, I think it's kind of interesting here, because to help bring... Um, things into focus for players and for a GM if they're doing a setting for a post-apocalyptic game. Um, and uh, so there's 22 questions, so let's get into them. One, what's the deal with my village's particular rite of passage? Which is good if your characters are starting in, in, all in the same village, which is, of course, I think the best, best way to do it for a post-apocalyptic setting. Um, and, you know, does your does the, the, the home center of the player characters have a rite of passage? You need, do you have to go out into the world and show that you are capable of surviving? For example, if you're playing a technically inclined character, does he have to go out in the, into the world and find an old tool and bring it back to show, yes, not only do I, am I capable of retrieving this, but I know how to use it. Uh, for example, um, I think I had once a multi-tool. That was the symbol of that particular clan's uh, technical skill. If you didn't have a multi-tool, essentially you could not be considered a member of the technical group within that, that society. Two, uh, which way to the nearest tavern? Simple. Know your territory. Um, know the layout of, uh, of where you live and the places that you have to connect to. Three, where do we, we buy use, useful gear? Again, know the shops, know the dealers, know the faces, know the, the technical people. Um, immerse your character in the setting so that you're not just on the surface that you're that you're in the setting itself. Um, four, where do you repair, reload, refuel these artifacts? Useful to know both within the original setting where you start out playing and eventually as the characters roam, roam the world because let's face it most apocalyptic post-apocalyptic settings like most fantasy settings are about exploring the world. Uh, five, where do we get some high-tech healing? Does your campaign have high tech healing? Um, did high tech healing exist prior to whatever it was that ended the ended the world? And if it did, how hard is it to come by? Or is your are you playing a really grim and gritty game where there may be no high tech healing, where the height of technical expertise could be today in 2013, and people have fallen from that, so you're trying to regain that? Um, six. Where do we fix our Resident Android slash robot. Um, so you know you have the, the assumption right there that the apocalypse happened after these things existed. They are still available in some degree or another. And how do you get them repaired? Can your group's technical person do this, or does they they have to go to like a technical temple where there are more advanced equipment and people that do this kind of thing? And if there are, will they release a robot after it's been repaired, or do they worship them? Are there groups out there composed of robots and androids who want to reclaim members of their society from the, the, the organics that they see as inferior or as the last step of evolution, whereas they are the next step? Um, seven, say, what is the local currency medium exchange anyway? Um, also good to know. I've In a post-apocalyptic setting, I think it's even more important than in a fantasy setting to have unique currencies to different regions. Now, precious metal is precious metal. And if you can get precious metal of a decent consistency, you'll probably be able to use that anywhere. But barter is going to be very important in a, in a, in a post-apocalyptic setting, in my opinion. Um, and you're not going to have universal currencies. Um, and, if you, and, I, and I think that's a big problem in some... I've seen some settings out there in my day where it was like inexplicably there were universal currencies everywhere. How does that happen in a world where there essentially is no real communication between communities at all? Um, they're very isolated, they're very defensive, um, and their needs are very different. So yeah, gold and silver is cool, but if you're in an area where that doesn't have any value, what do you trade? Um, eight. Are there any infamous ruins slash vaults, laboratories, installations around where same mutants fear to tread? Um, where are the hot spots, and in the case of post-apocalyptic setting, that could be a literal term, where are the hot spots for adventuring? Who has gone there before? Who could be in the process of exploring them now? And who is waiting to prey upon newbies who've come to explore them in the future? Um, nine, where is the closest contamination zone to 
It can actually try for powerful new mutations. Does your campaign have the ability for characters to gain new mutations? And if so, what kind are they going to get? Are you running a four-color Gamma World campaign where it's going to be very Marvel Universe? Or are you running Darwin's World where going into radiation zones is more than likely going to get you a nice case of cancer? Um, Ten, where do we get cures for the following conditions? Toxins, radiations, infections, lousy new mutations, nanobot infestations, corrupted data banks, broken cybernetic implants. Again, are these things in your campaign? If they are in your campaign, how do you de treat them? How do you deal with them? How were they acquired? How are they gotten rid of? These are all things to help immerse the GM and the players in their campaign. Um, Eleven, are there any cults, gangs, cryptic alliances I can join and or fight? I'm a big believer in these. Those that may have watched my over, uh, overkill videos, um, I have done an entire list of different groups that existed in that world. Um, though it was a little more settled in some way, it was more well, almost like 1950s with adventuring on the side, because there were places that were very civilized in the 1940s, 1950s tech levels. Um, I guess you would call that diesel punk, maybe, I'm not really sure. Um, and then outside that, there were places that you were still available to adventure in. It was a lot more political in some ways. Um, but I love cults, gangs, and cryptic alliances. I think they're very important, both as opposition, as competition, and as potential allies. Um, Twelve, where can I hire mercenaries? Also important, and I think also remember the player characters themselves may be mercenaries. I don't think I've ever seen a true post-apocalyptic setting that had... Um, alignments other than rifts. Most don't have alignment, so people are very much playing what they want in the world, and their actions are going to be very individualistic. So there isn't any, any overarching alignment systems, though rifts systems, palladium systems, is a little more realistic in, than, than some, for example. I think it's more realistic than the one that used in D&D, for example. Um, um, but the player characters could be mercenaries in themselves, and they may be in, in, in the business at some point of hiring mercenaries because they need additional grunts or specialists. Um, 13. Where can I find a technician, lore keeper, psychic, or other expert NPC? Right, it would connect to the, the uh, mercenaries. This list was well written. Um, and again, knowing the territory there where you live and the experts in the world around you so that you can find the information you need to complete your tasks. Um, 14. Where do I find a mighty mutant monster mount? Do you have those in the campaign? And if you do, how do you acquire them? Do you have to go out and wrangle one yourself, or can you uh, can you be lucky enough to like find someone that deals in them? Important. Sorry, I have a sniffling uh, allergies. It drives me nuts sometimes. Fifteen. Who is the greatest warlord in the wasteland? Who is the person at the top of the hill, and how do you go about knocking them off? Um, now, is the greatest warlord in the wasteland wasteland the classic bad guy? Is he more neutral, or is he a potential ally? Or does he appear to be any of these things, and is her she or she something else? Um, 17. Who is hoarding all the gasoline in the wasteland? Who has got the control of resources that are vital to your player characters' lives? Could be fuel, could be other things, um, but knowing this could help decide how the player characters go about running their lives. Um, 18. What critters are sufficiently terrorizing the wasteland that if I kill them, I become famous? What is there to slay, and how do I go about doing it? Of course, in the classic fantasy game, the, the top tier would be dragons or giants or things like that, but they can be much more varied in a post-apocalyptic setting. You can have all kinds of weird things. The most innocuous creature can have mutated over time into the greatest horror that anyone has ever seen. And it can even be interesting to find out that the Great Horror was in fact something that wasn't harmful at some point in the past. Or maybe it's been around since the destruction of the world itself. Maybe it's a part of some government program um, that was let free at the, when, the, when the war happened. You know, maybe it was something created after the war intentionally as a weapon against something else and it got free and turned on its master. There's lots of different ways to run that. Um, 19. Are there any wars brewing I can go I could go fight? There are always going to be conflicts, and how the player characters fit into those conflicts can be important. Do they start them? Do they avoid them? Are they suck suckered into fighting for one side or the other? Do they find a cause to champion, 
or someone that they need to think that, that the world will be better out, will be better off without. Um, that kind of large political landscape can be important. Um, uh, Tony, how about gladiatorial arenas complete with hard-won glory and fabulous artifact prizes? Now, I have used gladiatorial combat in post-apocalyptic settings myself, sometimes because it was done with slaves, sometimes because it was done by volunteers, and sometimes it's just for glory or for a small prize. Um, sometimes it's done by prisoners. Um, but there really weren't any fabulous artifact prizes. Those really didn't exist because why would you give those away? Why wouldn't you keep them for yourself? However, I have used gladiatorial combat myself in campaigns. Um, and sometimes it was done in non-lethal means. Sometimes it was done in, you know, if somebody dies, they die. And sometimes it was done specifically for who gets, uh, only one man leaves. Two men enter, one man leaves. Um, 21. Is there anywhere on the map where certain races are shunned, mutations and or artifacts are outlawed, and or the powers that be significantly hassle of the PCs? Are there authoritarian structures in the world that limit access to different things or are extremely prejudiced towards particular types of people? For example, ro zones controlled by the Knights of Genetic Purity shunning all mutants of any kind or areas that may enslave all mutant animals or enslave all mutant humans or just kill them on site. Places where you're not allowed to use electricity. Say it's an Amish community that only uses mutations and or Amish style community and they don't allow any kind of high-tech devices. Are there robot slash android controlled zones that do not allow people that are not also androids or, or robots to reside amongst them but they're willing to trade with the other, pop with the other populations. Um, Again, adding texture and, and flavor to your campaign. And 22. Are there means to journey into space or under the sea or through the dimensional barriers? Now, in every post-apocalyptic game I've ever run, and, and um, I think all of them were, almost all of them were Gamma World of some flavor or another, though I had significantly modified Gamma World in the past, um, I have always had... Uh, Undersea adventures, or under lake adventures, in the case of at least one, where the Great Lakes were the main body of water nearby. Um, and I'm a big believer in dimensional barriers. In fact, in Gamma World, there has there is a dimensional barrier ability where you can literally open a portal in, in front of you between your world and another. Um, and I've had player characters pulled into them and get stuck and have to find their way back. And in every campaign I've ever run, whether it was Dungeons and Dragons or Game World, I have always had an adventure where you got switched, where the D and D players got thrown into the Game World campaign, or the Game World characters got thrown into the D and D campaign. Campaign. I have always done it. I like those. I find them interesting, and entertaining. Um, I think they're fun. Um, the, my most favorite character I ever played, which was uh, Sir Lord Ranger Tacan, which is a poster on my. I have a portrait on my wall. Um, he not only visited high-tech places, but he came back with prizes. For example, he carries a Mark V blaster, and his Pegasus had been souped up with cybernetics. Uh, I think also his he had a familiar, a pseudo, uh, uh, pseudo dragon familiar that may have had some kind of modification done to it. Oh yes, he mutated while he was there, so he actually had functioning um, human characteristics, like fun fully functioning arms, not just dragon-style arms. Um, so these are questions I think are, are good and they're interesting and they spark thoughts and uh, uh, get a good ideas flowing for your campaign, whether you're a player character or a GM. Um, I thank uh, the owner of the Field Guide to Doomsday, whose name I don't remember. Uh, and, uh, oh, there it is, posted by Justin S. Davis at 4, 442 AM. He's like me, posts things way early in the morning. Um, so, look at these questions. I'll post a link to the to the to the uh, um, post on his blog, and come back with your own answers, your own video response. Tell me how would you go about using these questions in your post-apocalyptic campaign, either as a player or as a GM.